In this video, I interview James Fox. He directed the movie The Phenomenon in 2020 and the movie Moment of Contact that came out two weeks ago, amongst other documentaries on UAP. I cover a lot of ground in addition to Moment of Contact, simply because he has done so many interviews up until this point that I want to bring something new to the table. Get ready for bliss. For bliss. For bliss. All right, so James, we're gonna get into your movie Moment of Contact, which covers a UFO crash in Virginia, Brazil, 1996. But there's other questions I wanna ask you prior to that, and I'm just gonna go right in and ask, um, so, You've covered a lot of cases encompassing the uh, encounters of the third kind, which is people making contact with UFOs. Uh, you, they see an alien pilot, uh, maybe aboard or get off the craft, which is the most intimate kind of contact a human being can have. You've, you've covered this at least three times. You did it with Virginia, Brazil, 1996. You've done it with uh, you in the phenomenon. You covered the Rua Zimbabwe, 1994. UFO school landing where 60 plus students saw beings come out of a craft. Some of them actually received telepathic messages. And finally, West Hall 1966, I think it was, was also in the, the phenomenon where hundreds of students saw UAP hovering over their athletic field over some kind of tower. I don't recollect exactly, but maybe the craft even landed. So my first initial question to you is, how is it humanly possible that this level of contact could be going on? And in some cases, particularly with the Virginia Brazil case, where allegedly, and it's all allegedly, we don't need to keep saying that, but allegedly um, material and biological specimens were recovered. How is it possible that this is all going on simultaneously, seven plus billion of us have no idea and laugh at it. How is that even logically possible, James? <clears throat> well, I'll go back to the first time I heard about an alleged landing case and contact. Um, I was making my first film on the topic of UFOs. It was in the mid 90s. And I'm trying to think what yeah, mid probably nineties. Well, I was I've been working on it for a couple of years by the time 96, 97. And I was just naive enough to think that I could get an interview with Steven Spielberg. And I knew this woman, Janet Yang, who uh had worked with him or knew him. I said, I just I don't know, for some reason I was just thinking automatically that just because I was making a film on the topic of UFOs, that he would agree to meet with me. <laughs> And uh, long story short, he said no. And uh, he didn't say it to me. He said it to Janet. And Janet called me and she's like, well, he won't meet with you. But he does want you to know about this uh, this landing case at a school in Africa where apparently the beings, the occupants, exited the craft and made contact. And I said to myself right there on the spot, first of all, I'm not going to waste a second looking into this case because that's absurd and that there is no way that an incident of this magnitude particularly broad daylight with the sheer volume of eyewitness testimony could take place and the whole world not know about it so i just completely dismissed it immediately um as i did with virginia because you know it's just it's really hard to to imagine something like a, a, a crash could happen of, of, of an unknown object uh, being survive, be witnessed in a town in broad daylight. And, and like that story, just not making global headlines. I mean, it did get some attention, but global headlines um, just seemed in, inconceivable to me. Uh, but um I've looked into these cases extensively. I'm putting my near 30 year reputation on the line to report on this stuff. Um, I am now convinced that it happened. Now, whether it's the shock and awe factor of like, there's no way anyone's gonna believe this and it may, sort of covers itself up or whether the military was successful at silencing enough of the witnesses and, and, and uh, obfuscating the whole issue um or a combination of all of the above but but it 
uh, in my opinion, in the opinion of anyone who's seen Moment of Contact, uh, an extraordinary event took place in Virginia, Brazil in 1996. So my quest, second question is going to be, we can debate how good the evidence is for UAP and skeptics have good counter arguments for that, but that's not the question I want to ask. How good is the evidence that there are, that there's intimidation from military personnel, men in suits and this kind of stuff? Because for example, in the moment of contact, Carlos de Souza, about a half hour after he witnessed the crash, he was met with some, according to him, I think two men, two people in suits, they knew everything about him. They knew who his wife was. They knew who his children were, how they garnered that information that quickly, how they find, found him is kind of disturbing. Maybe you can, can hypothesize about that. And then not only that, in your the Phenomenon movie with the West Hall incident, one of the teachers, I believe, he was... He was contacted, I think, late in the night, knock on the door to two civilians. He was threatened with the Secrecy Act of Australia. He was threatened with being reported to the Department of Education that he may have been drinking if he were to go public with um, testifying that UAP did, in fact, come in close proximity to the school. To me, the evidence is 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 airtight that there are military personnel and men in suits that are intimidating people and asking them not to talk about their UFO sightings. If people want to argue, well, they're just doing this to create the illusion that there are UAP sightings, fine. They can argue that, and that's a fair argument. But what I don't think is a fair argument is there's just, it's just too ubiquitous. Too many people have come forward saying, I've been intimidated, I've been bribed, um, I've been told this, I've been told that, or for example, you you didn't see this, you didn't hear this. How good is the evidence for this happening over and over again? Intimidation from men in suits, military personnel, not to talk about their UFO sightings. So um, I, I could bore your audience to death with uh, the amount of times prior to my covering these alleged, these, these accounts of men in suits intimidating, uh, manipulating witnesses. Um, I'd heard stories. Well, the first time I heard it was in the '90s. I mean, I've the cases dating back to to McMinnville, Oregon, 1950, with Evelyn Trent. She described a man uh, in 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 plain clothes in a suit coming to her house, and her husband Paul Trent had taken a series of photographs of a of a disc in broad daylight. That you look up the Trent photographs; they're they're phenomenal. 1950. Um, then I I heard accounts uh, from the 1965 uh, Santa Ana Rex Heflin Polaroid pictures of him getting visits from government uh, officials. Didn't report on that. Didn't report on the ones in the 50s. I heard accounts from um, the 1980 Bent Waters UFO incident through the deputy base commander, Colonel Charles Halt, who told me that uh, a plane flew in from some base uh, and it was an unknown government U.S. agency that basically sanitized the whole story. I didn't report that time. Um, 1997, I was investigating the massive Phoenix, uh, so-called Phoenix Lights case. It was March 13th, 1997. And I was in touch at the time with a woman, Frances Barwood, who was counsel the council um, councilwoman Francis Barwood, and uh, again, photographic evidence was involved, and and these men in black showed up at this. And again, I didn't report on it and out of the blue. I didn't report it on it, and I know what I saw. I just had such a hard time wrapping my mind around some unknown government U.S. agency that has this sort of ubiquitous presence. intimidating witnesses, both military and civilian, it just seemed too outrageous. And I just couldn't report on it. I just thought it would kind of discredit my efforts. I got close when I interviewed a Belgian general. Um, his name uh, will, will come to me in, in a minute. But he, there was a, a very famous case of these massive triangular-shaped objects that were the size of a football field, Wilford de Brouwer. Um, and 
he had scrambled jets to intercept. He was a general in the in the um, Belgian Air Force, and he had ordered jets to scramble and intercept these unknowns. Uh, in I think it was like 89, 90, and 91. And uh, some unknown uh, U.S. government agents were asking for copies of the cockpit recordings, date the data. And uh, he said, sure, I can make copies of those for you, but I'm going to need to have an official request. And they refused to do that because there'd be a paper trail. Um, uh, so, uh, but when I got to Brazil, there was something about the mother of the two daughters that came within eight to 10 feet of this creature, this being, this thing. Um, so authentic, so pure, so honest. Uh, I just thought, you know what? It was kind of a bit, bit of a turning point. I, I can no longer ignore this, this aspect of the phenomenon that generally speaking, when there's a very, very credible case, uh, you get these men that show up and either in t- they either take all the compelling evidence or they'll try and influence the witnesses, intimidate the witnesses, tell the witnesses not to talk about certain aspects of the case. Um, I mean, it happened in 1964 with Lonnie, Officer Lonnie Zamora with the Socorro, New Mexico case. Um, uh, Lonnie saying that the, the military showed up and interrogated him for like four, five, six hours straight. Showed him photographs of similar objects that were that were classified. Um, you know, the the photographic evidence was classified. It was never made public. Um, and then just asked him to not talk about the the. Um, uh, the fact that he'd seen beings associated with the craft. So in any case, again, I'm boring your audience, but my point is, is that there was a preponderance of eyewitness testimony, both military and civilian, that there was some unknown government agency, U.S. government agency, that has an uncanny ability to monitor global cases and show up within hours or the next morning and intimidate witnesses. And it wasn't just Lonnie Zamora. Wasn't one of the teachers from the West Hall 1966. Oh, yeah. Look, like I said, I could go on. They, all they, they were showed a book, too, with Absolutely. photographs. I mean, yeah. this I, I find this so fascinating because from a skeptical standpoint, they do have good counter arguments for UAP. I don't agree with them, but they, they are very, very good counter arguments. They're, in my opinion, there's no good counter argument for this ubiquitous presence that is constantly intimidating witnesses because you you can argue that they're deluded, they're delusional about that. No, men in suits show up and intimidate them. They know what they're seeing, they know what they're experiencing. They're not making it up. This has repeated over and over again. Now I want to ask maybe sort of a philosophical question. Do well, you think- let me say one thing on on what you just mentioned? I've never heard a good counter argument for a credible report of a flying saucer. Fair enough. Show me an object that has the ability to hover without any air disturbance. Uh, without any visible means of propulsion, without any exhaust vents, without any wings, without any tail, and accelerate from a standstill to out of sight in the blink of an eye. I mean, without yeah. Any, without any wake, without any sonic boom, right angle turns at high speed. Just show me an object dating back to the 40s. Well, he, yeah, you know what the skeptics would say, and I'll just like cite the William T. Coleman, um, World War II decorated veteran flying from Miami, I think, to Mississippi. Uh, on a fairing mission and saw a perfect flying saucer and was corroborated by the other three engineers, I think the skeptics would say, well, they're misidentifying. But how are they how are they misidentifying when it was broad daylight and the plane was in such close proximity to the flying saucer itself? I think the likelihood is they saw what they said they saw. What do you think about that? Oh, it's an incredible case. Um, I went to great lengths to get William T. Coleman on camera because no one had ever done it, put him on camera properly for a real sit down, good, you know, 60 minute style interview. And remember, he was also public spokesman years after the the encounter that he had um, for Project Blue Book. So uh, he was a very, very good witness. He's a World War II pilot. He's, you know, and it wasn't like a quick sighting of saw something off in the distance. They actually thought they're going to collide with a flying saucer in 1955 in a B-25 uh, airplane over Alabama on the way to uh, Florida. I mean, it's it's one of the most dramatic encounters uh, I've heard. And funny enough, when they put him in, in sort of in charge, public spokesman for 
Project Blue Book, he said one of the first things he did was he went to see where his, because when he landed, he and all the crew were debriefed. And they all gave statements to Project Blue Book. It was in full swing at the time. It was 1955. And uh, and it was called Project Blue Book at the time. I don't think it was because it started off as Project. Um, well, it went from uh, uh, that to, to Project Grudge. No, Project Sign. The conclusions were being visited. Then it was Project Grudge. And then it was Project Blue Book, I think, in like 52 or something. But in any case, uh, that report... Uh, the more difficult to explain, the the higher quality eyewitness testimony, the less likely the, the less likely it would ever see the light of day. And he goes, to my amazement, my report that I gave detailed accounts about, and as did the three you know engineers that were in from Lockheed and Boeing that were in the B two five with them in nineteen fifty five, all gone. Just happened to be just not part of Project Blue Book. <laughs> Yeah. So coincidence? Yeah, I don't think so. So from a philosophical perspective, do you think whatever agency is behind these men in suits, let's assume that it's that it's taxpayer dollar funded. Do you think it's a waste of American taxpayer dollars? And do you think it's unethical for witnesses to get um, intimidated like they have throughout history? Uh, you know, I I. Um, people ask me. Often less so in the last couple of years, why it is that I do what I do. And I say, well, if you could like just to suspend judgment for a moment and imagine if Earth was being visited or if there was tangible evidence to suggest that we were not alone, uh, how significant of a story would you give that? And everyone says, well, gosh, if it was true, that would be... It would be huge. It would be the biggest story in the millennium. I mean, it was. It would be the number one. And I say, well, uh, I'm convinced it's happening. Do I like the fact that I keep hearing these accounts of censor censoring the witnesses, intimidating the witnesses, uh, obfuscation from 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 the government altogether? Uh, no, I don't. And. Uh, on the one hand, I kind of understand because it was explained to me one time the reasons for secrecy, and I kind of get it. Do I agree with it? I absolutely do not agree with it. But I remember this general saying to me, you know, because I said, why would anyone want to cover up one of the most amazing things? Like, you know, talk about an epiphany, like, wow, we're not alone, you know, we're not alone. He's like, you're looking at it all wrong. You know, military government officials think about it from the standpoint that you've got these unknown objects flying around in our airspace, uh, exhibiting a technology that's light years advanced from anything that we have. They fly rings around our fastest jets. We don't know who they are, where they come from, or what they want. To disclose that type of information uh, exposes their vulnerabilities. In other words, if they, they're not hostile, they haven't exhibited, ho we have exhibited hostile posture towards anything unknown in the, in the skies. They have not, like, overtly that I know of, attacked us. And if they did, according to all the witnesses I've ever talked to, we wouldn't stand a chance. Um, I can kind of see, you know, someone who's in charge of, securing our airspace that they probably wouldn't want to relinquish that type of information for fear of potential panic or exposing their vulnerabilities. I, I kind of get it. Do I agree with it? No, I don't. And I go on making these films because I think that people are entitled to know. In August, you wrote on Twitter, I'm, I'm thinking where's the definitive evidence and who has the authority to release it? is where you want to go next with your 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 next project. Have you started making any headway trying to under uh, trying to uncover where the definitive evidence of UAP is housed and who exactly has the authority to release it? Uh, I am uh, starting production next week on a new film and that is going to be my sole objective. I, I I intend to walk the halls of Congress 
talk to uh, uh, the task force, talk to people, uh, senators and, and congressmen that have been outspoken on this topic, find out what we now know. And remember, it's much more difficult for these guys to pull the wool over my eyes because quite honestly, without tooting my own horn, I'm, I'm a pretty well-informed citizen. <laughs> I've traveled around the world. I've made six films. I've met with high-ranking military and government officials from China and Russia and South America and all, all over. Uh, so um, when I met with Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid, former Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid, he said to me what we've all suspected for decades. He confirmed on camera, it's quite a shocking moment, that what has been released, the stuff that wound up splattered on the front page of the New York Times in 2017, that evidence is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, so my question is, and you know, look, and also investigating this alleged crash in Virginia, Brazil in 1996, that every Brazilian authority that I met with, we met with, um, all said that the United States was involved and that the bodies and debris ultimately went back to the United States. So where is this stuff? Where is this photographic evidence? It's extremely, not blurry vi videos, not like, you know, out of focus, distant stuff. I'm told that there's high resolution, close film footage of objects landing, objects taking off. Um, uh, where is it? And better yet, who has the authority to release it? Because I've been investigating presidents that have tried to get access to this stuff, and they've been unsuccessful. So if they don't have the authority to release this stuff, who does? And these are things that, these are, these are questions that I really want answers to. And so I'm going to dig my teeth into it. And look, everything that I do in the films that I make, I tell people, this is my personal journey. I'm extremely curious. When I stick my teeth into something, I really want answers or I want to resolve something. Um, and, 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 and I just happen to make these documentaries that I share the results of, of, of my research my travels, my meetings with the general public, because I feel like everyone's entitled, everyone should be entitled to this information. And so uh, my natural next step, particularly ap after having investigated on and off for 12 years, the Virginia UFO crash, and also my Brazilian counterpart and co-producer Marco Leal, uh, who's could never have done it without him. Um, when I found out, through high-level Brazilian military folks, um, that it the, the United States were involved, and it went back to the United States. I was like, "Oh my God!" Um, all right, well now I need to pick this up back in the United States and 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 find out, uh, you know, where potentially where this stuff is. And look, uh, just because you know where something is, it doesn't necessarily mean that you can get it released. And the same applies for photographic and videotaped evidence for the alleged creature in 1996 in Virginia, Brazil. Just because you locate something, it doesn't mean necessarily that you can get your hands on it. Just if we can speculate like, hey, we think it's at this military base, or it's that, we can do FOIA requests. We can, you know, do all the above, talk to senators that have some weight. Um, and, 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 and uh, you know, hopefully, hopefully get some answers. Since you've dropped the moment of contact film, do you anticipate that some of the witnesses from, from the United States Air Force that were involved in taking the remains of the craft and the biological creatures back to the United States will come forward and help corroborate even further this UFO event series? Uh, I'm, I'm hoping. Yeah, I'm hoping. The film has only been out for two weeks. Uh... Uh, I'm encouraged so far. It's uh, it's the number one doc on Apple and iTunes. And um, so there's clearly a demand, I think, for for this information, for this nature of 
of of uh, of of um you know investigations which is encouraging um but we'll see i, I think there's going to be some uh statements i was told by the end of october now i was said that i was i was told that it was postponed slightly maybe by a month month and a half but there are some um statements coming that apparently will add credence to my film this alleged crash retrieval from 1996 in in brazil where were these statements come from were you given that information uh, u.s government so do you think it's the ufo report that's been that that hasn't been made public yet do you think that's what the, your guy in the I, task I, force I, I, i'd only I, I could only speculate i, I really okay. don't know yeah okay i don't uh, know but it's, how- but it's a pretty pretty reliable source have you made any progress getting that video footage? Because I know you offered a two hundred thousand dollar reward to get, I think, a thirty five second video of the uh, creature itself. Have you made any any new updates on that? So uh, there's been a. I don't know if, if you or your audience has seen the article that was written. I think it was published on Saturday. What, what's today? Uh, today Thursday. Yes. So what was that five days ago? Uh, Michael Schellenberger in the New York Post. And it gave, have you seen it? Or your audience seen it? They, they may not have seen it. So you can go ahead okay. and go in, go into it. So, so a couple of people have come forward for the first time ever uh, in Brazil. And they have given detailed accounts of what the photographic evidence reveals. It's startling. I highly suggest... There are two New York Post articles on Moment of Contact that came out. Uh, One was on a Friday. The second one by Michael Schellenberger. Um, Let me make sure I got his name right. I'm so sorry. Oh, sure. Go ahead. Because this is something that your audience should 100% look into. I'll put Um, it in the links. Because it's very, very, yeah, Schellenberger. That's exactly right. Michael Schellenberger, uh, New York Post. And it came out on Saturday. Um, a level of detail for the first time in history on this case of what the photographic evidence that the people have seen it uh, reveals. And it, it's it's quite remarkable. Like if you haven't seen it, if you haven't read it, read it. Um, I'm going to remind your audience again, I know I just said this, but just because you locate something, it doesn't necessarily mean you can get your hands on it. Does it mean that we're not going to get our hands on it? No. Does it mean that possibly we're in negotiations or under consideration? Possibly. Um, We're doing everything in our power. People are pretty terrified. Eyewitnesses are pretty terrified. Um, Did you have a chance to take a look at the the film? Yes. You see a number of the witnesses that that refuse to go have their faces on camera. And and as I understand, none of the witnesses came to you. You had to track all of them down. Oh my God. And to me, that, that gives, that gives credibility to their testimony beg and plead with them for years years it was just a miracle a miracle that we got military acts along with everybody else the doctors the doctor who worked on the on the military police officer marco trezzi who died um uh after uh, reportedly handling one of these creatures capturing one of these creatures and he um, told and he told his wife and his sister about what happened, didn't he? He gave and, some and, and, details. And, and would that fall under the umbrella of a deathbed confession? I mean, didn't he tell them while he was dying? Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. He was in the hospital, and his and his sister came to him, but he didn't say, "I captured an ET, and you know, this is what killed okay. me." Okay. But apparently, his he told his doctor. The doctor who was working on him, what happened? And told his sister, "This is one of the biggest stories, and it'll it'll you know eventually kind of come out. This is this story will be huge, something like this." Um, 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 apparently, the the military came to. It's I don't know how much your audience knows about this case, so I don't want to get into too much detail without like doing a little bit of like maybe a an overview of the case or. You could ask me any specific aspects of it, um, but because um, I could just go on a tangent and get lost. So, <laughs> how how well corroborated 
I mean, it, the thing that I, one of the things that I loved about your film, I mean, it was extremely well edited, but one of the things I loved about your film is the corroboration is insane. I don't know how anyone could watch that film and not at least be suspicious that something truly extraordinary happened. I mean, how can you watch that and say, I don't buy it at all? There's a 0% chance. I don't see how that's even conceivable. But my question is, one of the one of the two biggest corroboration corroborations were disparate people describing the shape of the alien's foot, alleged alien, as well as the smell of the creatures themselves. How well corroborated are those two details? Unbelievable. Various people. You can just go into that. Unbelievable. I think you can sway any jury beyond a shadow of a doubt. In fact, I've got a really good friend of mine who's been um, rightfully so skeptical about the whole phenomenon for decades. Um, he was quite impressed with the phenomenon, the, the film I did in, that came out at the end of 2020. But he watched this one and I said, John, I know it. I know how crazy this sounds. And I don't expect you to believe this, but just suspend judgment. Have a look. And he called me like a couple of days later and he goes, I can't believe I'm saying this, but I actually believe that that happened. <laughs> no, it's very compelling. Very, very compelling. Like, you know, and I know I've, I've read a few um, highly uh, critical reviews and they, they say you shouldn't read reviews because it's kind of, you know, it's a little bit harsh. Um, and I could tell but the, the difference between the people that had seen the film, the people that had just seen the title of the film, you know, and the, the headline of it and just completely dismissed it. I get it. I too dismissed it. And and I don't blame that reluctance to believe something that's that out there because who would, but pretty crazy story. How big was the blockade that occurred? Let me ask you this. When did the blockade occur after the, the UAP crash and after people saw the three girls saw the the entity. How long after that did the military blockade occur? And how big was the military blockade? And did it preclude the media from getting access in pursuing the story that, that they wanted to uh, report to the people? So the local media, um, nay, was a uh, uh, TV prin princess, I think it was called. Uh, they... Word got out rather quickly when the girls came within eight to ten feet. There were three girls, two sisters, Valkyria and Liliani, and a third who was not a sister, it was a friend who was 21 years old by the name of Katya. And Katya and Liliani and Valkyria at three o'clock in the afternoon came within eight to ten feet, broad daylight, of this strange four foot tall, uh, creature with a big head, big, huge red eyes, about four times the size of ours, little ridges on the forehead, uh, spindly arms, spindly legs, weak, feeble, brown, oily skin, afraid, uh, cowering, um, afraid, weak and feeble, like it was suffering big time. Um, that account got spread like wildfire all across Virginia immediately within like, you know, 30 minutes. The local uh, press went out to investigate. There were military blockades all over the place. They, when they were asking questions, the ultimately the, the military, you know, told the local media, you ask one more question, you guys are all going to jail. So, then we've got locals that were just trying to get home. They had military blockades there. They were threatened at gunpoint. You're not going to step. I live right over here. What do you mean? I can't get through this roadblock. You you know, and then the guns point, you know, pulling up and putting it in their face. So we've got testimony from the local media, testimony from the residents, testimony from the girls that came within eight to 10 feet of the strange creature. Um, there's fire department people. I mean, it's just, uh, um, I think it's one of the best cases in modern history. Yeah, and you, you got you a whole town, and the and the vast majority of eyewitnesses are still alive. You know, oh. and you've got police and fire department and military, uh, the media, 
civilians, I mean, doctors, x-ray technicians, all testifying, and they all have a pretty remarkable piece of the puzzle. And when you put their story together, uh, it paints a pretty pretty big picture. Of yeah. What I mean, to me, the corroboration is mind-blowing. Um, we all know that Carlos de Souza was the one that initially saw, I mean, there might've been a lot of people that saw the craft going down that just never came forward. But Carlos, Carlos de Souza at around five in the morning or so, he saw the crash descending. It looked like it was in, it was, it was on, on its way to crashing some white smoke coming from it. And he later pursued it and went to some Maline farm or whatever it's called. And actually over basically a football field, saw all of the, all of the uh, remnants of the cr crash. But were there anybody else besides him in your film for my audience that saw the craft going down that increases the corroboration that there was indeed some kind of cigar shaped vehicle going down at the time. There were the two farmers or Alina and uh, Enrico de Fretas. And they saw the in fact I've got a prop that was used in the movie. Let me grab it. Sure. It's right here because I don't know. It's kind of special. special to me and this was something that carlos de salsa found in and around the crash site we used this prop in the film because he said it was shaped like a cigar and that the back side of it had a huge gash in it like it had been shot that it, it had been hit by something and then it had this weird white vapor coming out the back side of it like he said it's not smoke from a fire it was like a white vapor. He'd never seen anything like it. Well, uh, two farmers, and there were other witnesses as well, but on camera, in moment of contact, we've got two farmers, Orlina and Eurico de Fretas, two farmers that described exactly the same thing, a cigar-shaped object about the size of a large school bus with a gash in the side and white smoke coming out, looking like it was going to crash. In fact, the, the wife said uh i was waiting for impact i was i was expecting to hear an explosion because it looked like it was 100 percent going down it was in trouble what was the did did these witnesses coming forward because i want to emphasize that you had to uh pull teeth and and really go out of your way to get them to come forward they were not like i want to be on tv that's not how this panned out i mean uh, carlos de Souza, 26 not, years was vanished yeah, he was on camera like immediately after the, the the event, and then 26 years he's gone. No, no, no newspaper interview, no video interview. You're this the next gone. person, the gone. person to get him. Yeah, was it therapeutic for any of the witnesses coming forward to get it off their chest to talk about every it? single one of them, every single one of them, even the ones that didn't re reveal their faces. At the end, they said. I want to thank you so much for this opportunity. I feel this tremendous weight off my shoulders. I had to tell this story at least once in my lifetime. I couldn't take it to the grave. Well, I know that you said on a Reddit, ask me anything that this film, that at least you heard this, this film is making the rounds on the Hill, which is great. I think the Congress should be looking at this. And um, I'll just say this. I'm going to say it like your next project. I know this sounds funny, but like, I will guarantee that 95% of all humanity supports you in your next project, which is to find where is this the, this superior evidence housed and who has the authority to release it. All of humanity wants this to come, come to light. It's only a small select few people that somehow are involved in the secrecy that, that have bent over backwards to keep this from, from moving into the public sphere. I, I, I periodically, you know, it's, it's a lot of, it's a rather busy time for me right now. I'm pretty much exhausted all the time. Uh, but I'm, you know, uh, obviously, you know, I, do, I don't do this for the money. I never have done this for the money. I do it. I used to, I would have made more money flipping burgers until the phenomenon came out. And um, I used to have jobs, parking cars, delivering people's bags, painting houses, digging ditches, whatever it was to keep, you know, fueling my my interest in in, in making these films. And um, I uh, 
I just feel like it's one of the biggest stories in modern history. And uh, I, I can't, you know, once you realize that this is going on, it's really hard to turn your back on it, you know? Like, uh, you know, people just say, like, well, why do you, you know, what keeps you going? <laughs> it's like, well, gosh, you know, I'd love for my eight-year-old son to live in a world where this is no longer a secret. I'd love for him to to, to grow up in that reality. You know, even, if, even if it's a little scary, you know, it's like, hey, this is a big universe. There's a lot of things that we don't know. And that's okay, you know, but we're part of this much broader, bigger picture. Um, I think that's, that's, that's exciting to me. And, um, and it shouldn't be in the hands of a select few. Um, I see, you know, periodically people criticizing, you know, oh, well, it's just another documentary with a bunch of stupid eyewitness testimony. Where's the flippant evidence? Where's the photographic evidence? If you guys think for a moment that I'm not doing everything in my power to get that evidence, I really ask you to reconsider and think about that for a moment. The fact that I've dedicated pretty much my entire adult life, you know, on this topic. If you think that I'm not going after it, I really, and you don't think that I know how significant it would be to get my hands on it, uh, you know, Please just know, yeah, you, you, you have to try, regardless of how unlikely something is. You, you have to go for it, and I will always go for it, and I'll I will never stop going for it. And um, uh, it's it's easy to, you know, criticize someone's efforts uh, on the sidelines, but uh, but just know that I too recognize the level of significance a definitive piece of evidence would be, and I'm doing everything I can, everything I can to go after it. As I understand it, it was in the morning that one of the creatures was captured by Marco Cherizzi, and then it was in the evening that another of the creatures was uh, captured by the fire department. Did anybody from the fire department go All the way around? So the fire department captured it earlier that day. Oh, okay. Then the girls saw that other creature, and then... Marco Trees at around 5, 5.30 p.m., January 20th, 1996, uh, along with driver Eric Lopes, came upon an unknown creature and stopped the car. Marco leaps out, grabs the thing with his bare hands, and later dies. Did anyone from the fire department go on the record about um, capturing this this creature? The... Uh, Researchers Uberajara Rodriguez and Pacacini got testimony from the fire from the people involved in the fire department. In fact, they even visited the fire department in 2002, I think it was. We have that featured in the film. And then there was testimony of civilians, archival testimony, watching the operations take place and hearing the uh, capture and hearing the creature once it was bagged, um, apparently crying like a child. It was one of the most um uh startling pieces of eyewitness testimony that was just to think about this possible creature from another world being netted and captured and drug uh in um and then to, to think that it was crying like a baby um wow it was, it was um made a sort of indelible impression on on me and there are a handful handful of people in the in, that watch the documentary they go god that moment that witness said the, the creature was crying like a baby when it was captured is so intense but only like probably three percent of the people that watch the movie catch that and only about one percent of the people that watch the movie catch the fact that the entire family near the capture and encounter location saw an object a disc-shaped object later that night looking for something it's such compelling testimony it's like what were they looking for wait a minute check out proximity to capture site check out their home proximity to encounter site military blockade i mean you can only conclude one thing 
what they saw was looking to recover those beans. Do you have a hypothesis where where the Virginia creatures originate from, assuming it's all true? Do you have a hypothesis? Because I, I know we're delving into speculation world now, but for some reason I get this instinctive feel that the Virginia creatures are aboriginal to the earth. What's your what's your hypothesis as to where the, the Virginia creatures actually originate from? I, I don't have one, but the fact that there were there was a, a, an object um, that crashed, an unknown object, um, and the fact that there were a number of eyewitness accounts of a UFO looking for something to me seemed like a, a recovery effort, a recovery mission. Um, uh, that would indicate to me that they're from, they're not from here, but okay, that's just me. I could be totally wrong. I have no idea, but the fact they're in spaceships <laughs> tends to think that they don't come from the middle of the earth. <laughs> that's, that's a, that's, that's a, that's a fair point. Yeah. That's just me. Um, how confident are you that Eric Lopes was the driver when Marco Cherizzi acquired, he, he grabbed it, he put on his lap, Eric Lopes was the driver. How, how certain are you that he was the actual driver and how did you track him down? So we have, we have, we have, uh, uh, sorry, I'm just trying to figure out how to say this. We have, uh, rep- uh, a very credible report that Eric Lopes gave testimony one time to the gentleman that we spoke to and that he admitted the whole thing. But of course you've got his family. Uh, Eric Lopes was very good friends with Marco Trezzi, the, the, the other officer that was in the car with him. Um, testimony from uh, Marco Trees, the deceased officer's sister. Um, uh, testimony from the mother to the sister testimony from the wife that he was in that he was working that night he was on a a sort of a secret mission um and 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 testimony from one of the leading uh brazilian ufo researchers that eric lopes um had revealed to him that he was in, in fact the driver that night eric lopes did not deny it when we confronted him he said if you're here to talk about the et He's never going to talk, which is kind of funny because we never asked him, tell us about the, the ET. And and secondly, he threatened everybody with bullets to shoot everybody three times when he could have just said, you know what? There's nothing to this story. I wasn't driving. It's all fantasy and make-believe. He could have easily just walked outside and squashed it right then and there, but he didn't do that. Instead, he threatened to kill everybody. I'm never going to talk about this. He's not going to talk about the ET. Why would he say he's not going to talk about the ET? It's almost like he, that's to me, spoke volumes. Um, it's like the cops coming into a house in a raid and the people in the house go, there's no drugs in here, officer. It's like, well, yeah, well, we didn't even ask you about that. But now that you mention it. So I, I'm pretty confident. I'm pretty confident. Yeah. Do you think that this crash retrieval story is the most well corroborated crash retrieval story in the history of of UFOs? If you've ever looked into Roswell, there's a a lot more um, compelling testimony to support this case than there is in Roswell. I mean, how many people do you know in Roswell uh, that came within eight to ten feet of a live? being a live creature or alien or et or whatever you want to call it um, i haven't heard any of those accounts if we were to get confirmation maybe we'll get it in a month or two maybe we'll get it in five years yeah if we, if we were to get conf- well, i'll ask a two-part question number one is do you think we'll get confirmation in our lifetime and number two is what kind of impact upon humanity do you think ufo confirmation would have on human psychology and culture well, I mean, everything changed in in 2017 when 
uh, former uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Intelligence, Christopher Mellon, teamed up with Lou Elizondo, found a loophole, and walked that evidence out of the Pentagon and onto the front page of the New York Times. You, you can't put the genie back in the bottle, right? So the fact that the intelligence folks have confirmed that those videotapes of unknowns are legitimate and the fact that they have admitted that there are unknown objects e exhibiting this technology that doesn't seem to be um, of human origin. Kind of a big deal. It's kind of a big statement. Um, basically saying that UFOs are real. We just don't know what they are or where they come from, right? I don't anticipate that we're going to go backwards at this point. I think that um, the genie's out of the bottle. Um, baby steps. There are those that feel we're all entitled on the inside, that we are entitled, and that this should come out. And that there are those on the inside, I'm told, that don't agree with that, that don't feel that humanity is ready. Um, I happen to think that it's exactly what probably humanity needs right now. Um, it's a very divisive time for, for us. Um, and, and I've always felt that. I've been saying it for over 20 years. that I, I've always felt that this would have a, a, a very unifying uh, impact on all of humanity, all of human race, you know, that we would possibly look at ourselves uh, as, uh, as who we really are. And that's, you know, one, one species, one race, one planet. And um, I mean, you know, the world changed during the Apollo missions. I mean, when we first had looked back at that uh, image of earth, when they're on their way to the moon and you see this little, blue ball suspended in this vast darkness of space, this vacuum of space. That's pretty impactful. You know, I remember talking to Edgar Mitchell, who was the sixth man to walk on the moon, Apollo 14. I interviewed him on a number of occasions and featured him in, in, a, in several films. And he said to me, boy, it's quite humbling looking back at this little blue marble suspended in this vacuum of space. And you don't see any borders and you don't see any, wars or you know what i mean like he's like you you really you really realize that you know we're we really are one one race on this little tiny uh oasis in the in the, in the middle of this vast universe um it's quite uh humbling and uh you know i think the uap story the ufo story um would have a overall a pretty positive effect which makes the secrecy all the more ironic um so i'll just ask you one last question to wrap it up yep. is um what do you want people to take away from your film number one and number two you can just tell people where to find it and maybe you want to encourage my audience to rate the film because i think that would help it uh get distributed more you know, it's funny. Uh, it, it is quite helpful uh, if people take a moment on iTunes or Amazon or both and just rate the film. Um, I, you know, uh, it, it does help with the algorithms. It helps um, with these executives that I'm dealing with that don't really care one way or the other whether the, the, the phenomenon is real. They just <laughs> look like, oh, it's this UFO related stuff. It does well. But but when it does well, it does get further exposure. And, and, and if, and, and if we're all in, in this together, uh, if you're interested in helping further, get further dis distribution and exposure for this film, I would uh, strongly encourage your audience. If you wouldn't mind taking a moment and doing that, it'd be tremendously helpful. Uh, I recognize the level of reluctance to uh, believe an incident of this magnitude could happen and I think that everyone admits, uh, if I just say, look, you know, don't don't believe it happened or if it didn't happen, or if it happened or it didn't happen, just forget about all that. If it did, how significant, everyone goes, oh, my God, it'd be the biggest story ever. Well, I just ask you to, to open your mind, suspend that judgment, and, and, and listen to the eyewitness testimony, and then draw your own conclusions. That's it. And if I can get 
mainstream to, to consider the fact that this event, I'm not trying to get people to join my cult. I really hope that your audience knows that. I, I'm really not. I, I'm just trying to put uh, what I feel is very, very tangible, very, very credible, very, very compelling eyewitness testimony about an event that could be extremely significant to humanity. Fantastic, uh, James. I'll, Fantastic, yeah. James. And uh, wish you the best of luck with the moment of contact and with the project you're going forward with. Like I said, I know it sounds silly, but I think uh, 95% of all of humanity supports you trying to uncover where the hell is all of this high high um, fidelity data being stored and who the hell has the authority to release it? Because it seems like even the president is not in the loop on this. And that's this is a real problem with the state of our world, our democracy, our civilization. Thank you so much, uh, James. And um, I look forward to your next documentary. Thank you so much for having me on. All right, great. Take care. We did it, fam. An hour of James Fox and UAP Jesus. It is what it is. Please do not forget to subscribe. If you'd like to support this channel, you can check out my merch shop where I sell t-shirts. You can become a patron. You could become a YouTube member. You could give me a one-time donation. All of those possibilities are in the description box below, or you could just slap a like on this bad boy and I'll appreciate it so much. Thank you so much for watching and I look forward to seeing you in the next episode. Special thanks to all patrons, YouTube members, those that have bought merch, those that have given me one-time donation. I couldn't do without you. Thank you so much. See you in the next episode.